שלמה בריך ספרו. בריך ספרו. The answer is בריך טוב, right? Uh, I'm happy again to be with you uh, this uh, second session of the new program uh, in the SYGG, the Serio Youth Global Gathering, which we started this year in, uh, in the, the fifth edition of the SYGG. We changed it, as I said yesterday, from the leadership program to the spiritual formation program, which means we're going to learn from now on in every SYGG about a new teaching, a new dogma, a new theology from our church. And yesterday we, uh, uh, we started, today also we'll continue with the sacraments, the mysteries. Uh, we learned about what does it mean, uh, a sacrament, uh, as Shamosho uh, uh, Imad explained yesterday, we have uh, this uh, terminology, let's say, uh, mysteries um, or mysterium uh, and rose or raza. Um, what does it mean? Where the, did this term come from? Uh, we saw in the Bible, in the Old Testament, uh, especially in the book of, uh, of Daniel and uh, uh, other books. Today we will continue uh, the second session uh, with uh, uh, Abun Miakro. Uh, Rabban De Roy Roger. Uh, Abuna Roger is uh, the director of the uh, Syriac uh, Department Studies or Department of the Syriac Studies. Um, you can, by the way, go to the, this website, uh, the dss syriac uh, patriarchate.org, and you, if you want anything about the Syriac Studies, Syriac theology, Syriac, fa uh, Syriac, uh, Syriac fathers, you can find them all there. Um, thank you for the great job, uh, Abuna Roger, uh, on this website. It's an amazing website. It's for you guys. You can uh, go to that website. It's a, a, a font, a, a, a source uh, from our church. So it's for you. Yesterday we have learned, as I said, about... Um, the meaning and the terminology of uh, uh, maestries of sacraments from the beginning till the five, the fifth century or the fourth century. Today we will continue with Abu Naroje from the fourth century or the fifth century till today. Yesterday it was till yesterday, so today it is till today. Um, I know it's a little bit hard as we speak theology here, although it's hard, but it's so important. So please, if you don't understand anything, this program is for you. If you want to be repeated again, uh, we are ready, uh, any one of us, especially the speakers, Abu Naroje and uh, Shamu Shohimad, and also in private, if you want to ask any question uh, about uh, this mystery, we cannot um, uh, give everything in, in just two days for this spiritual formation, but we are trying to do our best and to give you um, um, a little bit about uh, uh, our theology, the Syriac Orthodox theology. Uh, so we will continue with Abu Naroje today. Uh, thank you once again. And um, uh, as I said, if you have any question, please do not hesitate to ask. Taudi Abuna, Fkut. Uh, so they have learned Brichtobo. Barhmur Abun Malio, Mor Antimos Jack, Abuna Yohanon. And uh, I will be glad today to participate for the first time in the SIG and to speak to you about a topic of theology that we started yesterday, which is, as you have seen, not fast food. Theology, so it is something uh, which needs a little bit concentration to be uh, received. So we'll continue today to speak about the sacraments, but according to the theology of the Syriac Orthodox Church only. Today, if I go and ask a Syriac Orthodox uh, 
faithful. What does he know about sacraments? So he will probably answer that there are seven sacraments. If, it, if we ask what are these sacraments, it will be baptism, confirmation, Eucharist, penance, marriage, ordination of priests, bishops, priesthood, and finally, the unction of the sick, the unction of the sick. But what most of us do not know is that this theology of the seven sacraments is late in the history of the church. It appears in the 12th century in the West, in the Western church, in the Catholic church, in the 12th century, 1150. And then it is accepted or adopted or received by Eastern churches gradually, by the Greek Orthodox, by the Coptic, the Syriac. The Syriac, for example, accepted this new theology in the last two centuries only. So speaking about seven sacraments in the Syriac church appeared only two centuries ago. It is not traditional. So there is a traditional theology of the Syriac Orthodox Church, which is different from the Greek and from the Latin theology. Traditionally, we have our own theology about sacraments, which is not seven sacraments. That doesn't, that doesn't mean we didn't have marriage or the unction of the sick or uh, the confirmation, etc. No, but counting these, numbering these rites as sacraments, seven sacraments, was not a traditional our church. So our church has its own theology, which begins, let's say, in the fourth century with St. Ephraim and continues in the fifth and sixth century with very eminent fathers like St. Jacob of Sarug, Morphiloxenos of Mabug, St. Severus, these of Antioch, these saints, fathers of the church, wrote about the sacraments. And it is a very critical turning point in the history of our church, the fifth century, because the division of the church began in the fifth century. So from the fifth onwards, we have our own theology. And we need to know today what was the theology of the Syriac Orthodox Fathers about the sacraments. Okay, so I will speak today about four points. First, we will see what is the Rosu in Syriac sacrament or mystery, the concept according to the Syriac Fathers from the fifth century onwards. And second, we will see are there some special groups of rosé? Because we will see we have a big number of rosé. So do we have a special groups in this big number of rosé that we have, which have something special? And thirdly, we'll speak about the giver of sacraments, be it the Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit, or the priest who is giving the sacraments, what is his role? And on the fourth point, we'll speak about the receiver of the sacrament, the faithful, and what is the role of his faith. If he has faith in the sacrament, uh, he receives the grace, but if he doesn't have a faith, if he doesn't have an orthodox faith, so what happens with the sacrament? Do we repeat them? Are they effective for him or not? So we are speaking in the fourth point about the receiver of the sacraments. So we begin with our first point, the concept of rozo or mystery or sacrament. Surprisingly, we don't find in the history of the Syriac church any treatise about the seven sacraments until the 20th century. 
We didn't have any treatise, any writing, any book about the seven sacraments until the 20th century. Not even about the sacraments in general. The number seven and the sacraments themselves. <coughs> we don't have special treatise about what is the idea of sacrament. We don't find such thing. Whereas the Catholic, as I said, since the Middle Ages, when I speak about Middle Ages, is approximately the 8th to the 13th century. Okay, this is what we call the Middle Ages. And we call this period the scholastic period because the theology during this period was based in the West on the Aristotelian philosophy, the philosophy of Aristotle. Okay? and on the Bible, the Church Fathers, but the system of philosophy used in the West during this period was the system of Aristotle. So it's a very specific theology of the West. In this system of theology, based on the Aristotelian system, they began to speak about seven sacraments in the West, and they wrote special treatises to explain what are the seven sacraments. We didn't have, in parallel, something uh, similar in our Syriac Orthodox Church. So we didn't have any treatise about the seven sacraments and not even about the concept of rozo, of sacrament. What did we have instead of that? The Church Father, the Syriac Father, did reflect about the mysteries, about the sacraments, but not in a special book. So the issues that the Catholic were studying or discussing in their theology were discussed in the Syriac world, but not in special books or treatises. For example, what is the efficacy of the matter? So when we use water in the baptism, bread and wine, speaking about these matters, these elements, what are their efficacy? Is the matter important is the water important or only the faith of the person who is coming to baptism is important speaking about these sides the Syriac fathers spoke about these topics okay but in a different context not as i said in books specifically for sacraments for example what is the value of the sacraments given by heretics people of other churches if someone is today Protestant or from another church and is giving baptism. Is this baptism valid, accepted, or not? These issues were discussed by the Syriac fathers. At the time, we will speak about people uh, who had received baptism in the Nestorian church or in the Chalcedonian church and other churches, not in the Protestant church. At that time, they were not Protestants yet. What is the relation between between the matter, as I said, the grace, etc. So all these questions were studied occasionally and not systemat systematically in a special treatise. When the Syriac fathers wrote treatise, treatises on mysteries, Al Rose, we find such books on Rose. What did they mean by that? They meant they wanted to explain all the symbols that are in the rites, the gestures, the objects, the sacred vessels, what is the priest saying during this rite or that rite. So we are explaining the symbols. This was rose. So the symbols, the meanings of the sacred objects was mysteries, was rose. Okay, so speaking about rose is not speaking about the seven sacraments, but speaking about the symbols that are in the movements, in the gestures, in the prayer. For example, if we take the rejection of devil in the baptism, what does that mean? Why the priest will breathe in the faith of the believer? What does it mean that we confess the Christ? Why we face to the East? Why the priest, for example, in the 
holy mirun, with the holy mirun, he seals the bap, the baptized person with the holy mirun. What is the meaning of the sealment, the sealing? Okay, all these gestures, movements, acts, practices, which have symbolic meaning, okay, the treatises on mysteries, on rose, was intended to explain these meanings. Why do we need, for example, on uh, the days of the year, but between Easter and the Pentecost, we don't kneel. So, in these treatises on sacraments, we explain why in these 50 days, there is no kneeling in the church. Okay? This is included in the treatises on mysteries. But we also have some church fathers who wrote about mysteries. Saint Cyril of uh, Jerusalem in the fourth century, Saint John Chrysostom, Yohanan Fumudahbo, we call it in Syriac, we call him in Syriac. So they wrote about baptism, about Eucharist. So in the period before the fifth century. If you arrive to the fifth century, we have a very important writer in the church who is not well known. His name is Dionysius. You know the name of Sayyid Najan, more Dionysius. Dionysius actually was a disciple of Saint Paul. We read about him in the Acts of the Apostles. But an unknown writer in the year 500 began to write theological books and putting them in the name of Dionysius. He was probably a monk, today we know he was a monk, living in Syria and writing in Greek. He was very influential in the history of the church. He influenced the West, the East, because all thought he was the disciple of St. Paul at the time. But in fact, he was an author living in the year 500. So later we, we started calling him Pseudo Dionysius. So he's not the real Dionysius, but a Pseudo Dionysius. Okay? He was writing around the year 500, and he wrote about the mysteries of the church. And exactly, he wrote about six mysteries which they are the baptism, Eucharist, consecration of Miron, the perfumed oil, Murun, the ordination, the tonsure. What is the tonsure? Anybody know what is the tonsure? Suforo. Suforo, which is the consecration of monks. So ordination of priests and consecration of monks the tonsure, so we cut the hair of the monk, and this is called tonsure. And finally, the burial rite, the rite for the dead. So he wrote about the meaning of these six rites, and he considered them as mysteries. He called them actually telete in Greek, which means perfections, perfections, he means by that the right accomplished or practiced in the church. And after him, after this Dionysius, the Syriac fathers began to write treatises about mysteries, so to explain the symbolism that we find in these rites. Okay? To explain the symbols that we find in the baptism, as I explained earlier, in the Eucharist, in the consecration of Miron, what is the meaning of the oil, why we do, for example, a procession in the church, we take the oil in the church, what does this procession mean, all the meaning of the gestures, and the other rites. So the Syriac fathers who came after Dionysius, who wrote about mysteries, were, for the most known, George, Bishop of the Arabs, he was a bishop of the Arab tribes. He was in the 8th century. Mushe Barkifo, 9th century. He was a bishop of Mosul. John of Dara, 
Bishop of Dara near Mardin today in Turkey, also in the 8th, 9th century. Mor Dionysos Barsalibi, a well-known theologian of the 12th century. Yaqub Barshako, so he was Bishop of Amida of Diyarbakir, Barsalibi. Yaqub Barshako, he was in Iraq also, in Dairud Mormatta, 13th century, and the famous Bar Abroyo. Bar Abroyo, also Mafriono, he was so the Bishop of the East in Iraq, based in Mormatta Monastery, and in the 13th century. All these authors wrote about sacraments. The last one, Bar Abroyo, whose memory we commemorated yesterday. His feast was on yesterday, 13th of uh, July, 30th of July. So Bar Abroyo spoke about five special rites that he called, like Dionysius, shumloye, perfections, that are perfected by the priests or the bishops in the church. And these are the laying on of hands, the imposition of hands, the ordination, priesthood. Second, the consecration of Miron, of the oil. Third, baptism. Four, four Eucharist. And five, the burial rite. Five, Shumloye. In another book, so these, he spoke about them in his book we call Norath Kutsch. In another book, he add to these five the consecration of churches. So he explained the symbols about the consecration of a church. So we find that in the top of the theology of the Syriac Orthodox Church, we were speaking about five, five shumloi, five perfections, five special rites explained by Bar Abroyo. But the list is not closed. As I said, it's not a fixed number. The number is not important because Bar Abroyo was speaking about the consecration of churches. Churches are consecrated with Miron. So the consecration of Miron is somehow a part of the second, of the consecration of Miron. Okay, it's linked. No, no, the rite of consecrating the oil, which is celebrated traditionally on the uh, Monday, Thursday, the Holy Thursday of the Holy Week. Okay, we consecrate the Miron. So Bar Abroyo is making a distinction between what he calls perfections. Uh, let me see. Yeah, about between perfections and mysteries. The perfections are the rites th through which the priest is giving a grace to the faithful. Okay? So what we call today sacrament, the seventh sacrament, Barabro call it shumloyu. And what we call Rozo, in the meaning of Bar Abroyo, was the symbols in these shumloye. I repeat. So the rites themselves, they are called shumloye for Bar Abroyo. The symbols in these rites are rose. Okay? So a different, we have to change a little bit to understand, because today we call rose these rites, but it was at the time the symbols in the rites. So not the rite itself? The rite itself is called shumloyo. Shumloyo, and the symbols in the rite are rose. They make it rose, the, the, they make the rite rose. Yes, because in every ceremony, the material objects used are pointing to a celestial reality. 
okay the idea a celestial in the heaven a heavenly reality the idea since dionysius that i mentioned that everything that we are practicing in the church is a participation in a heavenly liturgy that is happening in heaven before god if we are celebrating for example the eucharist we are celebrating the eucharist of the lamb that in the revelation was seen by saint john in heaven sitting on the throne okay so i saw this picture uh, not long ago uh, on facebook somebody make it and it is what i want to say to express here is that what you see in eucharist a priest a bishop celebrating or here the patriarch but actually this altar that we call trunus or throne is the throne of jesus christ in front of, of whom we are celebrating the eucharist okay so every right that's why we should explain why we are doing for example if we take the maruhotho you know the maruhotho the fans that we use so it is a symbol of the angel the angels the krube the cherubims that are praising god unceasingly in heaven so we use the fans okay maruhotho you hear their voices during eucharist so on the treatises in the treatises on sacraments we explain what these symbols these objects these rites mean okay so what we got finally about the concept of rosso what is the concept of rosso if i have to summarize this first point what is rosso so rosso is a broad concept and not a technical word as sacrament in the latin tradition okay we have seen that in the latin tradition we arrived we reach a point that we have seven sacraments something which is fixed and well known but in the syriac word the rosso is something broad yesterday we have spoke about we have spoken about uh, the sacraments in the old testament which are prefigurations symbols about christ but in the liturgical sense of rosso we have three meanings which can be given to rosso what rosso mean first rosso may be the rite which have which has a mystical meaning every rite in the church which has a mystical meaning is a rosso second which we emphasize much more than others is the symbolic significance of the gestures the objects the sayings these are also rosé and third the consecrated elements the matters in the rites for example the water the water is rosso the oil is rosso the bread and wine is rosso we say for example men qdom in sibutho de rose holen before partaking in these rose in these mysteries what we call these mysteries is the bread and the wine which became the body and the blood of christ okay so rosso may mean the right the meanings and the matters the elements i go to the second point about special groups of rosé a first group is about the sacraments which communicate the holy spirit we have four sacraments four rites that communicate that give the holy spirit in the baptism we have the holy spirit and the anointing with the miron when we seal the baptized with miron also there is a gift of the holy spirit third in the absolution absolution shroyo 
So when the priest pray and accept a penitent who come back to the church, he is giving him again the Holy Spirit. Because when he left the church by his sin, he was far from the Holy Spirit. Bringing him back inside the church, especially for the heretics, especially for the heretics, because when they went out of the church, they're still Christian, but without the Holy Spirit working in their lives. So when they come back to the church and they are accepted by the bishop who prays for them the absolution, the prayer of absolution, they are given back the Holy Spirit. Okay? And last thing, the laying on of hands. In an ordination also, the Holy Spirit is given. So there is a common idea about these four rites, four roses, that fourth of them communicate, give the Holy Spirit. If I take the example, for example, of the tonsure, the consecration of a monk, there is no laying of hands, laying on of hands on the monk. He's not consecrated priest. So there is no Holy Spirit given in the tonsure. The tonsure is a rite of penance, penitence. A person who would like to live the life of penitence can come and become a monk and live this Tiobuthu for his all long uh, life. Okay, so there is no Holy Spirit communicated to the person who become who becomes monk. So it is not counted with these rites. Another group is the sacraments that can be given only one time in life. Baptism is given only one time. The anointing with Miron or the confirmation with Miron also is given only one time. And the ordination is given only one time. This problem was a very tough problem in the history of the church about the heretics. When somebody was baptized in a heretical group, when he came back to the church, the question was, should we repeat his baptism? Or, was it, or should we accept him as he is? If he was already ordained priest by a schismatic church, a separated church, a non-Orthodox church, and he comes back to the, our, to the Orthodox church. Should we repeat his ordination again, ordain him again? So it was discussed a, a lot at that time. Uh, for example, more severius will say, if we are in a doubtful case and we don't know if the person is baptized or not, we can baptizing him in a conditional way, saying, and is baptized if he is not in the name of the Holy Trinity. Okay? If he is not baptized, flown and is baptized. Uh, the repetition of the ordination was a horrible thing. We can take an example from the history of the church. When in the, in the earlier time of the church, in the early times of church, Patriarchs were chosen among the monks. They were ordained first priests or bishops, if they were not priests, bishops, and then installed as patriarch. But sometimes when they started to choose the patriarchs from the bishops, there was an error in some, at some point in the history of the church. They repeated the ordination of the bishop, although he was already ordained bishop before. So when they wanted to make him patriarch, they ordained him again. And Bar Abroyo was criticizing that very harshly. He said he is already bishop, and when he, come, when, when he becomes patriarch, we don't ordain him again. He is already ordained. So all what we do is to install him as patriarch. But we don't repeat the ordination. The ordination cannot be repeated. It's very... Uh, horrible 
and there is only one baptism, one ordination. Uh, yes, even with the heretics, they made sometimes distinctions between heresies, but most of the time they accepted the ordination made also by non-Orthodox. What was the logic at that time is that as soon as he comes back to the church, he will be accepted in the church, he will receive the Holy Church from the, uh, the Holy Spirit, sorry, by the mouth of the church of the bishop who is accepting him, as I said, with the absolution. Okay, the idea of giving him the Holy Spirit in the ordination was replaced by his acceptance through the absolution. They wanted to uh, avoid scandal, sa scandals in the church. They wanted to avoid scandals in repeating the ordinations of hundreds and hundreds of priests and bishops. So they decided that they will not repeat the ordination. Mm. The priesthood will be with him. Even though he is leaving the church, he will be a priest, but the effects of his priesthood, the fruits of his ordination, will be like uh, abolished or uh, frozen because he's outside the Orthodox Church. There is an author, uh, Bar Wahboon, in the uh, 12th century. He explained, he said, Peter was given the keys. Then he denied Christ as if he was outside of the church. When Christ brought him back in the church, he did not give him the keys again. He, he didn't ordain him again as a priest. He only accepted him, his penitence. So there is no second ordination, only the acceptance of the church. So the denial of Peter did not revo remove from him the priesthood. Now, a very important category about sacraments are the sacraments composed from matter and spirit. What do I mean by sacraments? There are three sacraments composed from matter and spirit. This group includes baptism, accomplished with water, the anointing with miron, second matter, the oil, and thirdly, the Eucharist with bread and wine. There are three rites, only three rites, three rosé, three sacraments, which include a matter consecrated by the invocation of the Holy Spirit, the descent of the Holy Spirit upon the matter. We call the Holy Spirit to come upon the waters in the baptism, about the oil when we consecrate the miron, and upon the bread and the wine in Eucharist. So we have only these three matters or these three sacraments in which the divine, the Holy Spirit, come upon the matter. So the Holy Spirit fills the matter, the elements. He, come, he comes and fills the matter. These three sacraments were very important from Pseudo Dionysius that we uh, mentioned earlier. They were also important for Job, Bishop of the Arabs. He speak only about these three sacraments. If we take the concept of this idea, so it is about the matter which receives the Holy Spirit and the power of God for the salvation of man. What is also important is that these three matters, the water, the oil, the bread and wine, are used for the salvation of man. Okay? So it has uh, an importance more than the other rites of the church because these are for the salvation. 
Philoxenos of Mabug, Philoxenos of Mabug, the author in the sixth century, so he was Bishop of Mabug, today is near Halab, Halab Manbij in Syria. He was Bishop there, he died in 523, was always setting in parallel these three sacraments, speaking about them, about what happens to the baptism, how the water will become a womb, womb, carso rohonoito, which will generate a new creation, a new man born from the womb of the water. He will speak about the oil, which becomes the power of Christ, and third, about the bread and wine becoming body and blood of Christ. In many, many times, he will set in parallel these three sacraments. He will say so in this paragraph, I quote, also we cannot comprehend how the bread and the wine become by means of the Holy Spirit, as we mentioned, the Holy Spirit will come upon them, the body and the blood of Christ, of God. We cannot comprehend how the water and the spirit become one baptism. And the spirit and the oil become one holy power of Christ. So we have the three. Let's take another paragraph. It is not through change, that the bread and the wine become body and blood. The oil becomes power. The water, spiritual womb and the old man and new man in the baptism. But by the union of the spirit with them, they become through this power of the Holy Spirit what we believe they indeed are. Likewise, and here he makes a comparison with what happened in the incarnation of God when God became man in Jesus Christ, he said, Likewise, the word of God, Jesus, did not become man and incarnated by means of change, but because he partook of our body and blood, and his divinity was united with the humanity. This comparison is very important. So we are saying that all the idea of sacraments is based on the idea of God becoming man. He was God, and he became man and he didn't change from the fact that he is always God but he became also man in the same way now the matter the water becomes a womb and is still water as God is always God when he became man the water will become womb a spiritual womb and it will remain water there is no change. It's not through change. It's changing the material itself. Yes, it's a becoming and not a change. It's a becoming and not a change. It becomes a spiritual womb, but it doesn't change. It's always water. If you take it to a laboratory, to, you make uh, an analysis about the water, it's always water. Yes, and the oil in the same manner. The bread and the wine, they don't change, but they become body and blood of Christ. A third time, Philoxenos says, and we are saying, seeing that he is taking always the same idea, the same three mysteries. He's saying, if a Jew or a heathen, a pagan, approaches you inquiring about the mysteries, performed by the church. So he's calling them mysteries. Performed by the church and says, how can the water become a womb which gives the people a new birth and the oils become a power and the bread change into a, into a body and the wine into blood? You will tell him so and so. Okay, so I think that in all these passage, passages, Philoxenus is making a comparison between the three. Uh, I like this text also of Philoxenus, who is speaking about the Eucharist and the faith. He says, 
For instance, you carry in your hands the consecrated bread of mysteries that is common bread according to its nature. It's bread. Naturally, it's bread. Yet, faith perceives it as the body of the only begotten one. The eye of faith does not observe as the physical eye observes, but faith compels the body's vision to see something that is invisible to it. The body sees bread and wine and oil and water. So I'm repeating the same bread, wine, oil, water. But faith compels its vision to see spiritually something that is not physically visible to it. That is, instead of bread, one shall taste the body. Instead of wine, one shall drink the blood. Instead of water, one shall see spiritual baptism. Instead of oil, one shall see the power of Christ. So many church fathers made this comparison between these three sacraments. Baptism, Miron, and Eucharist. When we speak about Miron here, we are speaking about the consecration of Miron and not about the confirmation, the sealing with Miron during baptism. Okay? Not the receiving of the Miron. When we are speaking about the Miron, the oil, the consecrated oil, we are speaking when this oil is consecrated in a ceremony of the consecration of Miron, not when we are giving the Miron to the baptized. Okay? When does this oil become power? When we consecrate it alone. Yes? Consecration is kudosho, so when we pray to be uh, on the matters to be consecrated, to be to become holy. Okay. Sanctification. Dumkachina. Umeshho. Okay. Katat serio. Mkachina. Yani kudosho. Mkachina u zaito. Dhoe zaito mkacho. So the right that we call it uh, mystery or rozo, is when we consecrate, when we will pray the prayer over the oil and it will become power of Christ, over the water in baptism, over the bread and wine in the Eucharist. So you can see that we have three rites in which we pray the Holy Spirit over the matters to consecrate these matters. Okay? So we have three, not seven. Yes. Mm -hmm. But um, you mentioned that it is not even a change. Yes, a becoming and not a change. I made a distinction between a change and a becoming. So when a child becomes uh, a young man, he is becoming and he's changing. But he's still at the same time the same person. So there is let's say, uh, a becoming with change. And for the human be and uh, there is a stable thing, it is the same person. For the humans, all becomings includes changes. When be you become something else, you change. For all the created beings, every becoming include changing. But for God, who, is, who cannot change, okay, God does not change, he can become something else without changing, because he's God. And the, and the Lord is still in flesh. Yes, God he's, still God. he's still God. God manifested in the flesh. He's still God walking within us, and he's still God. And this is the mystery. How can he become a new thing without changing from what he was before this becoming? This is the core of the idea of mystery. We cannot comprehend how he is at the same time God, the creator of everything, and at the same time he is a man 
living uh, like a man who is uh, limited, etc. He, he is, uh, sorry, and this is the paradox that he is God who is uh, the living, who cannot die, and he is at the same time a man who dies. He is not limited as God, he is limited as man. There's a paradox in this, but it can be real because it happened, and it can happen only with God. Okay? Yes, the idea. The faith. So the faith is what is our position when we cannot understand with our mind the eye of the faith should see something beyond the eye of the body. That's why the eye of the body will see bread and wine, but the eye of the faith will see the, bre uh, the blood and the body of Christ. So we should not start with faith yes, we can say that. Hmm? Speculate, so to speak, uh, uh, theory and... Uh, yeah, philosophy about that, to understand philosophically. So, if we have seen that we have three sacraments, where do the idea or the list of the seven sacraments come from? I mentioned earlier that it, it is from the Catholic tradition, okay? It comes from the 20th century, Peter Lombard, in 1150, he defined for the first time in history the seven sacraments in the Western Church. And he gave three criteria for a right to be considered a sacrament. He said it should be first uh, with a sign, a matter. Okay. It should be instituted by the Lord, directly or indirectly, given by the Lord, Jesus. And the, mat the question of the efficacy, so the material sign, the water, the bread, etc., should be the cause of the grace given in the sacrament, not only a mere symbol, something symbolic, but it should give a power. Okay? But the Syriac Church Fathers didn't consider the seven sacraments of the Western Church as sacraments. If we have taken only the baptism, the Miron, and the Eucharist, so there are four not counted as sacraments by our tradition, traditionally. For example, the anointing of the sick, it was practiced privately in houses. It's a prayer practiced in houses. The priest was going to the house praying for the sick. He was giving them the anointing with the oil. And that's why probably, because this rite didn't include a consecration of a matter, which was changed into something else, but only a rite, a blessing with the oil. So it was not considered as a sacrament. There is no matter element on which we call the Holy Spirit to come and to change it into something else, okay? If we take the marriage also, the marriage in itself doesn't contain any matter, any tangible matter, something we can touch. We have the water, the oil, the bread and wine, and the other sacraments, but in marriage, what is the matter? So it is a blessing of the priest who is in the marriage, in this ceremony, okay? But it's not considered as a sacrament. I repeat again, the marriage existed since the beginning with a presence of the church blessing through the priest. But it was not considered as a sacrament because it does not have a matter on which we call the Holy Spirit to come and to consecrate it, to bless it. And third, the penance, Teobuso, okay, penitence also lacks the matter, no tangible matter. What is the matter in penitence? Although this was not accepted as sacraments in the tradition of our church, yet in the 18th century, a monk called Abdel Nur of Ahmed started by the influence 
of the Catholic missionaries who came to the East, to Turkey, to Syria, to teach about the seven sacraments. The Catholic imported their theology with their, the missionaries, and they began to teach about seven sacraments. So a monk in our church wrote in 726 about, uh, sorry, in the 1726, about the seven sacraments, a book. It was not printed until 1890, end of the 19th century. It was printed in the Zafaran by a bishop, Abdullah Sattouf, who became later Patriarch Abdullah II. And in the 20th century, we became to have this teaching more and more usual in our church about the seven sacraments, like the Catholic teaching. And we find it in all the books of catechism printed in our church. Uh, two books appeared uh, in 1955 and in 1970, first by Dolabani about the seven sacraments of the church, and the second by Bishop Sewer Zaka Iwas and Rabban Ishaq Saka about the seven sacraments of the church. They spoke about the seven sacraments in the Catholic teaching, and they gave it a frame of Syriac theology. They mentioned sometimes more Afre, more Yahu, more Philoxenos, but they were explaining not the ideas of the Syriac fathers, but the ideas of the Catholic Church, the base of the Catholic theology about the seven sacraments. It's not something peculiar to our church, the Oriental churches, the different Oriental churches were influenced uh, unwillingly, I will say, by this theology of the seven sacraments through the missionaries. It's three, as we said, in the traditional uh, Syriac Orthodox theology. Yes. Now if we speak about the giver of the sacraments uh, quickly, the apostolic origin of the sacraments. So if we are speaking about the three, about the sacraments in general, when did Christ instituted marriage? If we are accepting the sacraments will be given by the Lord. When did he give the marriage? He was present at Cana, yes. But he didn't institute it, a sacrament of marriage by his presence in Cana wedding. Okay. Marriage was from the beginning, as he said, since Adam and Eve. Uh, when did he consecrate Miron? Also uh, an important question. When did he give Miron? The burial rites, when did he? Because more, uh, Barabroi was considering burial rite as a perfection, a sacrament. So we didn't have this idea that it should be given directly uh, from the Christ. And the tonsure, same thing, the consecration of monks, the ordination of monks. Although Barsalibi was trying to find a solution for the question, where did we get the consecration of Miron? He said, people again ask, from where did the apostles learn to consecrate the Miron? And some of the doctors, Barkifa, say they, they have learned it in the upper room, the Elithu when they uh, ate the Passover on the Thursday of the Holy Week. And he told them to perform, so Jesus told them to perform the memory of his death through the bread and wine. Similarly, he told them to consecrate the Miron. This is evident from the fact that on the same day, Miron is consecrated on an altar and the bread is blessed as in the upper room. On a single evening, he told them to do the memory of his death through the Qurbana and his anointing through the Miron. That's why we call it Hamshud Rose. Others say that he told them about the Miron on the Mount Olives when he ascended to heaven. This is evident from the fact that he blessed his disciples and stretched his hand over them there. Others say that the Holy Spirit told the apostles to make the Miron when he descended upon them in the form of the tongues of fire. This is evident from what the Son has said from what which is mine, he takes and informs you. So the later, the Holy Spirit told them. So we, f we can find that Barsalibi would like to say that the Miron, consecration of Miron, 
is given by the Lord of the Holy Spirit. So we maintain that the baptism is well known, given by Christ, go and baptize all the nations. The Eucharist was given in the upper room. And the Miron also is given by the Lord. So idea that a sacrament should be given by the Lord is there in the three cases. Yes. Yes. No, no, no. We accept that from the apostles it was spread to all the churches, not from the Greek church to our church. Okay. So if we speak about who gives the sacrament, the invisible administrators, administrator or giver of the sacraments is God, Jesus. And that's why, for example, Morsuerius will say, it is not Paul and not Apollo who baptizes, but it is God himself. So in a ceremony, in a sacrament, although the priest is in front of you, but in the belief of our church, it is God performing through the priest. And the idea is confirmed by the formula we use in the baptism. What do we say? So N is baptized. In all our rites, we don't use the direct form of I baptize you. But N is baptized, so to say, is baptized by the Holy Trinity. So who is performing, not the priest himself, but the Holy Trinity or Christ through the priest. We say for penitence, Shpiqin hau baikun. Your sins are forgiven. So are forgiven by Christ, not by I forgive you your sins. Shoren ul khun haikun. It's not a Syriac formula. Okay? N is anointed. Anointed with the holy Miron. Anointed. Okay. Mithim Shah, Mithir Shem, Mith Ahmed, etc. Etc. So the second idea about that is that Miron is a symbol of Christ. Murun, perfumed oil, is a symbol of Christ himself. We found that it is the power of Christ, the Miron. And through Miron, all the church rites are performed. In the book of the Song of Songs, it is said, your name is a perfumed oil. Your name, speaking about Christ. Your, your name is a perfumed oil or your name is Miron. And that's why we consider that Christ equal Miron, Murun. And through Miron, we consecrate the altars on which we celebrate the Eucharist. So there is no Eucharist if we don't have the altar consecrated with Miron. Through Miron, we consecrate the baptism, the person, etc. So the Miron is the base. And when we speak Miron, we are talking about Christ himself. So without Christ, nothing from the rites would, would happen. Concerning the human minister of the sacraments, uh, can say that it should be a priest, a monk who didn't receive the Holy Spirit cannot administer the sacraments, cannot give the sacraments. And here arises the problem of the baptism of Protestants, for instance, who uh, receive the baptism from their churches without priesthood, without a priest. So is their sacrament valid or not? As I explained before, I will introduce these two terms now, flexibility and exactness. So the church father explained that we have two things, two concepts to consider. If we were to speak exactic, exactly with exactness, we would say they didn't receive the baptism because there is no priesthood. Same for the heretics the old times. But the church also should consider the flexibility 
and avoiding the scandals of repeating baptism of all the people baptized in other churches. So it accepts the baptism of other churches, even though they are not Orthodox. But when they come to the Orthodox Church, they only give them the anointing with the Holy Miron, who is the base of everything, as I explained earlier. Okay, so we should consider these two concepts of flexibility and exactness, oikonomia and akrivia. Concerning the moral unworthiness of the minister, um, we know that for the church fathers, it doesn't matter if the priest is a holy man or not when he is giving the sacrament. Okay, uh, we know from the example given by St. Gregory of Nazians, he says when the wax, the wax with, that is sealed with a seal made of gold or of lead, in both cases, it will bear the same signet and the same seal. Okay, when you have the seal, be it in with gold or with lead, it will have the same image. Okay, so if the priest is a man, a holy one or not, he will give always the same sacraments. Because as we said, it is God who is giving the sacrament through him. Finally, the receiver of the sacrament, the last point, and you should go fast in this point. The receiver of the sacrament, his face and the efficacy of the matter. Bar Abroyo says in his book, the priesthood is the way that leads the man from the animal conducts to the angelic ones through the material things. We spoke about the material things, water, oil, etc. Where the type of the immaterial is represented as the perfumed oil, the heavenly bread, and the giving life wine. So he is emphasizing the role of the matter, of the elements themselves. So it is not that only the faith of the person matters. In the theology of the Syriac Orthodox Church, the Holy Spirit will always use the matter to give his grace. Okay? He will use the oil to give the grace of the new uh, of the power of Christ. He will use the water to give the grace of the new birth. He will use the bread and wine to give the body and blood of Christ. So he, here I'm speaking against an idea, a Protestant, let's say, idea about symbols, that symbols are only uh, external. They don't have any efficacy on the person. What counts is only the faith of the person who is coming to receive the sacrament, the baptism. So, uh, Morphiloxenus will say these, the mysteries of the church, appear simple things to the eye, but through the descent of the Holy Spirit, they receive a supernatural power. The water, for example, becomes a womb, which makes man from material spiritual beings. The oil receives sanctifying power that anoints and sanctifies soul and body altogether. The bread and the wine become the body and the blood of the incarnate God. So always we have both the matter and the face working together. I will conclude this part with this saying of Jacob of Sarug, who is speaking about the child who is receiving baptism. And he is saying, although he is not knowing what's happening around him, but the faith is always required, okay? Faith is the cause of the, uh, the, ma uh, the grace that we are receiving, but we will receive it also through the matter. He says, the church received the child with, of a few days old from his parents, and the church baptizes and pardons and sanctifies him while he perceives it not, the believing parents bring the child to baptism and the Lord sees their faith, so the faith should be there, and the Lord sees their faith and sanctifies him 
and admits him to the adoption of sons, while he knows it not, and writes his name in the church of the firstborn, as he perceives it not. Conclusion. The mysteries of the church in the Syriac tradition are numerous, are many, and there is no specified or traditional number. The mainstream is that there are specified elements which receive divine power after the invocation of the Holy Spirit and his descent upon them in the liturgical celebration. And here we are speaking about three, what water, oil, bread, and wine. Before the invocation of the Holy Spirit, these elements are ordinary, profane. After the descent of the Holy Spirit, they are perfected. They arrive to the accomplishment, to the perfection. Say, Like the mysteries and symbols of the Old Testament, which are accomplished in the Christ. Water becomes a spiritual womb. The oil, Christ's power. The bread and the wine, his body and blood. Therefore, the rites during which these sacraments are accomplished are called perfections, shumloye. The water is used in the baptism, in the blessing of water on the day of Epiphany, in, the, in blessing everything new, in purifying defiled items, in the order of kneeling conducted on the Sunday of Pentecost, we use the water in all these rites. For the oil, it is consecrated and it becomes holy miron, a sacrament with different applications. We use the oil in different applications. Among them, we have the confirmation, but not only the confirmation, the consecration of churches is made, performed with the oil, the miron. The burial of dead, also we use the oil. The anointing of the sick, of the sick in Qandilo, we use the oil. Nowadays, we are uh, making a difference between three types of oil, the miron, which we call Mishhot Kutsho, Moron, the consecrated oil for catechumens, Mishhot Met Tartione, Mishhot Zaito, Dhoilam Shihutho, and oil of the sick, Mishhot Akrihe, Mishhot Aslutho, Aukith Dosyutho. And the third element is the bread and the wine, which are blessed and consecrated in the Eucharist, but are given also in different ceremonies. In the baptism, we give the bread and the wine to the baptized child and in different uh, ceremonies in marriage before marriage we give them the eucharist so there are three main sacraments baptism the consecration of miron and eucharist performed with matter filled with the holy spirit water oil bread and wine bar abro you mentioned enumerated five rites shumloye adding to the previous three the priesthood and the burial of dead we understand why the priesthood may be considered as a sacrament, for it includes a sign, the laying on of hands. Though it is not properly a matter, the laying on of hands is not a matter, and it confers the Holy Spirit in ordination. So Barabroyo added the ordination of priest to these. And a text in the liturgy also speaks about it when it says in the baptism rite, three holy mysteries, Cloth Rose Qadishe, have been granted by our Lord to the church, redeemed by his cross. Baptism, Eucharist, and the honorable priest. So in baptism, we included baptism and oil, bread and wine in the Eucharist, and the honorable priest or priesthood who makes atonement for the sin of his flock. Hallelujah, and entreats for mercy. Keeping the symbolic number three was significant. We have three here also, because it alludes to the Trinity, the foremost mystery of the Christianity. Thank you. Uh, wow, Abuna, God bless you. Uh, it was amazing, was it? Yes. 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 <laughs> was it? Yes. We had a. Uh, uh, I think a complete idea about the sacraments in these two days since yesterday we started from the beginning 
uh, where does the, the, the name of sacrament or mysteries or rozo came from, what does it mean, etc., etc. And Abuna today um, had uh, 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 put all that, uh, 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 the theological meaning uh, uh, of rozo or sacrament or mystery uh, in, 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 uh, in, uh, uh, in a perfect way to let us understand uh, what does it mean uh, really rozo or what does it mean um, a sacrament for us and how we receive it and uh, who is the the one who is giving that as the picture says what you see is you see the priest is celebrating the, the holy liturgy but uh, what you don't see what what is happening actually it's god jesus himself uh, on the trunos on the altar on his chair uh, 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 celebrating all that or performing all that uh, 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 that right um, we will start with questions uh, but I have to start first uh, actually I have three questions <laughs> three in one <laughs> three in one um, first one um, you mentioned that Jesus Christ told uh, one of our fathers said that Jesus Christ told his disciples also about Miron. Uh, but if we go to, to the Bible, especially in the act of the apostles, we see after the descendant of the Holy Spirit, after the Pentecost, Pentecost day, when the two of the seven deacons went to uh, Samaria, and baptized a lot of people. They didn't perform another action until they called Peter and John, two of the apostles, to let them receive the Holy Spirit. And if we say that the Holy Miron is a symbol or a symbolic of the Holy Spirit, and Jesus told them about that, before in the upper room so why then in the act uh, 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 the book of the acts uh, they asked for two of the disciples to come to Samaria and lie down their hand upon all the baptized men and women at that time this is my first question second question uh, you said that a normal man cannot perform uh, a baptism. Let's say, speaking about a baptism, because he does not have a Holy Spirit. At the same time, so it's a question in three questions. At the same time, we say that in an um, uh, extraordinary occasion, let's say a very dangerous occasion, anyone can perform the, the baptism even if, if, if uh, uh, the mother of a child who is dying. She can say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Huh? You, are baptized. you are baptized. I mean, you are baptized. Yes, with, with the health. This is, this is so important. This is so important. Okay? But we know that we all receive the Holy Spirit at the time of the baptism right we we receive the holy spirit so we we, we born again from the womb of uh, 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 of uh, 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 the baptism font okay the water this is the second question the third question i hope i i didn't forget it um i think i forget it now you can answer these two questions until i uh, I remember the other one. Thank you. So concerning the Miron, the story of the book of the Acts in chapter 8 says that two of the deacons went and gave the baptism to the people of Samaria. And they, they wanted two of the apostles to give the Holy Spirit through the laying on of hands. So we can see that at the time there was not 
the miron as oil, but the laying on of hands. So we can see there that the authority was given only to the apostles to give the laying on of hands and to give the Holy Spirit through this laying on of hands. So it was very important that the Holy Spirit was not given by every one to everyone, but only through the authority of the apostles who were laying on the hands on the people and giving them the Holy Spirit. So this is what is important in the story of the chapter 8 of the Acts of the Apostles. Now concerning the Miron and institution of the Miron, when I mentioned what was said by Bar Salibi, it was to show that uh, for him this should be instituted by the Lord himself or by the Holy Spirit. So it comes directly from the apostolic, an apostolic origin or even from the Lord. And that's why it continues and it is a sacrament in the church. So we can discuss with him, was it given on the Thursday, was it given uh, later on the day of Pentecost, on the day of the Ascension, it, sh it can be discussed. And uh, Barsalibi is giving many options and he's saying some say so, others say so. So he's discussing the matter. But what is important in all these ideas is that it comes from the Lord and the Holy Spirit through the apostolic origin. So he is maintaining this uh, point. Okay, uh, Concerning uh, the baptism, by a non-priest, uh, a deacon. So we should know what is the rule, what is the exception. The rule is that a priest is giving the baptism. But as we said, in flexi with flexibility, in extraordinary situations, the church accepts sometimes that a lay man can give the baptism especially for the idea that the baptism is performed by Christ himself. But when he comes back to the church, and if the person was in danger of death, etc., and he, is, he comes back to the church, what the church will make is to, giving, to give him the anointing, which is, uh, let's say, the equivalent of the baptism. Because in baptism, we anoint the child or the baptized man and when we give him the anointing of the miron it is we give him the holy spirit okay so it is compensated by the miron when the person come to church so in extraordinary situation it it can happen like in the catholic church but in regular situation no it is only the priest who can baptize I yeah, uh, it, 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 you said also uh, Barsalibi said or Bar, uh, Barabroyo uh, that uh, we baptized Barsalibi, maybe. We baptized the child. Why we, we baptized them? Uh, Jack, Jacob of Saruk. Uh, Saruk. Uh, why we baptized them? Because uh, uh, we need faith, and faith is an essential thing, right? And uh, upon their parents' faith, we baptized their children. My question is, what if, and we see this situation now in our days, what if their parents' faith, it's very weak? What if his father, for example, is um, gambling from the morning until uh, and he's doing uh, a worldly uh, uh, deeds. What, is, what if his mother also, she's not a, a, a faithful woman or, or a Christian, a real Christian, um, and they come to church just to, for, to perform a rite, just to, to do something that we, we will baptize our son and, and then after that we go to a restaurant or we do some, uh, is the baptism valid? under that condition? Thank you. Uh, yes, it, is, it will be valid. The baptism will be uh, valid even though the faith is not uh, complete. The faith is confessed in baptism. It should be, I confess you Christ. And the parents or 
the Qaribu, Al-Arab, who comes uh, with the person and who stands for uh, the person baptized, will confess this faith. So this is the condition inside the right to give the baptism. Then after the baptism, the grace is given to the child. Will the, chi the child grow in that grace given to him and baptized or not? It depends on his environment, yani environment, sorry. So it will depend on his parents, his house, if he will g grow in the grace or not, if he will work with that grace given to him, okay? If he will give it a place in his life. But the baptism, the grace is given because the faith is confessed and proclaimed inside the church in the rite itself. He doesn't believe in them. That's, that's the role of the priest to, let's say, guide the parents or find the good person who will be the qaribu, who will be the person guiding uh, the baptized child and following him. Even in the Gospels, even in the Gospels, when Jesus healed uh, the son of the paralytic uh, of uh, the sick man, actually, uh, Jesus was asking him, do you believe? And the father of this sick man was saying, I believe, but help my lack of faith. So there is no perfect faith. Okay, if there is no faith at all, okay, it's a question. I will say, I will say that the faith of the church who is baptizing the priest, the shamoshi, the whole church was baptizing is there, is present. But I repeat, this grace given through baptism may not be active in his life, effective in his life, if he is not surrounded by faithful uh, and people. Yes. It is so. I, I ask this question because it's so important point, and also the Bible is mentioning that uh, that point on the epistle to Galatians, uh, when Saint Paul is saying, <coughs> "Sorry, the people who were uh, who, 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 they were baptized for Moses in the desert, so the people of Israel in Corinthians, sorry." Uh, the, the people, they were uh, baptized uh, for Moses in the desert when they uh, we, um, uh, crossed the, 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 the Red Sea. Okay, so at that point we see before, before the, uh, the, they crossed the, 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 the Red Sea, a lot of people, they were, uh, they were arguing with Moses, why you brought us here? And, and Pharaoh and all the Egyptians' army are behind us. They're going to kill us. So the lake of faith is, is there, right? But uh, uh, yet, when uh, they crossed the, the, the Red Sea, um, they, they all, the parents, took their child with them and they crossed the, the Red Sea. So lake of faith, sometimes, yes, there is but at least a minimum of, 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 uh, of um, a proven act, let's say, uh, can save the child. Toji, if you have any other questions, please come here, for, uh, come here and ask him. Ladies first, yes, come. Um, it was mentioned that uh, if a mother saw her child in fear, unbaptized, of course, that she could baptize the, the child. But you also mentioned that then the child needs to come to church and the priest has to uh, anoint him with the holy miron. But what if the child dies? Do you still anoint him or what happens? So if he dies, no, we don't anoint him 
again uh, with the holy miron if he uh, dies okay we can uh, celebrate the burial uh, ritual in which we have the oil but not the uh, miron okay so we will anoint him with the oil but not with mishho but not with the miron okay we, uh, jacob of sarug was making a comparison actually it's interesting to know between the burial ritual and the baptism of the infants of the children so he is saying that in both cases the receiver of the sacrament does not feel what is given to him when we give the oil to the dead person we anoint him with oil or when we give to the child the person who is receiving this sacrament is not feeling so it is not about feelings about psychology what will i feel when i receive this matter the grace of god does not uh, wait for the psychology of the person to work in her okay so he was making this comparison Uh, we, we were talking about uh, Peter, that Jesus dis did not ordain him again after the sin. So uh, in the liturgy, we, I, I read that uh, Judas lost his priesthood when Jesus washed his feet. What meaning does this have? Thank you. Yes, uh, this will mean symbolically, okay, he lost his priesthood. If we take it today when a priest is excommunicated from the church so he is set outside the church by the authority by the bishop if he makes great mistakes okay he will conserve his priesthood he will have it always but but as i said it is frozen it's not fruitful even though he goes and ordain uh, baptize etc the people will be baptized but as long as they live outside the church, they are losing the fruits of the Holy Spirit actively in their lives. Okay, so the priesthood cannot be removed, let's say, uh, completely, but it can be the activity of the priesthood will be stopped, frozen. Okay, no fruits outside of the Holy Church. Thank you for a very good lecture, Abuna. Uh, how should I formulate this question? Ah, yes. Uh, you said that the bread and wine do not change, it becomes, right? But however, Bar Salibi in his Anafora uses the word shahlef. How are we asked to understand this word or this terminology? Thank you, it is a good question. Uh, actually, who is refusing the terminology of change is Philoxenos in the sixth century. Okay, because he made this comparison between the incarnation and what happens in Eucharist. In the incarnation, there is no change. God does not change. He's still God when he becomes man. And in Eucharist, the bread does not change it is still bread, but it becomes the body of Christ. So he's of the sixth century, a theologian of the sixth century, and making this comparison. When we go to the 12th century, Barsalibi, he's not, let's say, um, inhabited by this idea of the change. So the, let's say, his system was not, not the same system as Philoxenus. He was not thinking with the same words. That's what is important about studying the history of theology. You can see how some concepts will evolve with centuries. So what was said at a stage, maybe it was not very well uh, later, uh, let's say, expressed with the same phrase. And uh, what is important, uh, I think, and uh, here is that Morphiloxenus is more accurate. And I prefer his terminology about becoming than about changing. 
okay? And uh, here we can later speak in another lecture about uh, the idea of transubstantiation in the Catholic theology when we, they say that there is a change in the nature of bread, in the nature of wine, transubstantiation. So, uh, there is a change in the nature, which is completely against the idea of philoxenism. There is no change in the substance, in the nature. So Barsalibi, when he speaks about change, he means the body changed to become, changed to become yes. body. Not in his substance, it's in nature. I will try in English. Yes. Okay. It's about the sentence in uh, the church when you say, Who is that Chayo? And obligatory, it seems you have to have repentance about uh, definition about Lat Chayo in this sentence, in this sacrament. We speak, about, we speak about penitence and Eucharist in the workshop that we will have on Friday. I will speak about it, I will not anticipate today. But at Chayu does not mean that we are with no sin. Okay? We approach the mysteries as sinners. And the mysteries, Kutche is given for the forgiveness of sins. Okay? Chayu are the prepared one, but not necessarily the people without sin. No, we go and take and partake in the Eucharist as sinners. Thank you for the great lecture. Yeah, sorry. I actually have two questions, mostly like adding on uh, Sayyidina's uh, questions. The first one is like, it's a bit unclear to me, like why did they decide to, yeah, oh, sorry. Why did they decide on like uh, implementing all the rose and symbols? Uh, like for example, concerning the baptism, like implementing like the murun or like the breathing uh, because from like maybe I'm wrong but like from how I understand it from like the Gospels or the book of Acts like they didn't baptize this way back then so why did I why did they decide to implement it yeah the second one is a bit different so. oh yeah um, hope I remember uh, uh, it's like the baptism, like the only way to like receive the Holy Spirit, because uh, in the book of Acts, I think chapter 10, like when you look at uh, Cornelius and his household, like he first received the Holy Spirit and then got baptized. Oh yeah. So. So um, my question was about we are giving the um, the Mahmudito and the Miron together, but like others they don't. Uh, for example, the Catholics, it's like you just get the Mahmudito and then on a couple of years later you uh, uh, you you get the uh, Miron, the confirmation. So why is that so? Yes, here we start to go inside some uh, topics which are not included in the introduction to the sacraments. The first question about the symbols. So we should understand why the church uses symbols in its rites. Okay, so in the Old Testament, symbols were present. Okay, uh, if you read the books of Leviticus, Exodus, etc., how God ordained Moses to make the tent, etc. He was using the symbols. Jesus, when he gave his body and blood through the bread and wine, he used symbols. He used material things to symbolize something else, to, to mean something else. So the idea of the symbols in the church is based on the practice of the Old Testament, on the practice of Jesus Christ and on the concept of incarnation. God, who is spirit, comes through a man, a concretized man, a matter. So God is not speaking to us only through thought, speculation, but through 
also signs. Okay, he's, he's using signs and symbols. And that on that base, the church also is built with symbols, with signs. Okay, because it is the method of God in speaking with man. Even, even in the resurrection, we will rise with spiritual bodies, not with only souls, with spiritual bodies. The body is always there, even after the resurrection. So the matter resists. It's always there. Man is composed of matter and spirit. Man is not only soul or mind. Okay, that's why we should understand the base of this uh, idea, the concept of rosa, to understand why we are using symbols. Now, if we uh, add symbols in the rites or we take out some symbols, not important. Not the number of symbols is important, breathing or not, but the concept of having signs and symbol, symbols is very important because it is rooted in the Bible, in the practice of Jesus, and in the incarnation, the concept of incarnation of God. Okay? Second, concerning baptism and Holy Spirit given in the Acts. We, when we read the book of the Acts, chapter 10, it has a message given to Peter. The message was given to Peter is to tell him that you should accept the pagans directly. Because Peter had the idea to make them first Jews and then to baptize them. He thought that God would not accept them directly to the Christian faith. They should go first through the Jewish faith and then become Christians. And God, when he gave the Holy Spirit directly to the pagans, it was a message to Peter. You should understand that God is accepting these people directly. They should not go through the Jewish faith. So it is a particular uh, episode in the Acts, and it's not the regular way that the Holy Spirit is given with the baptism. Okay, it was just a message for people. It cannot be used as an example for all uh, the baptism, the idea of baptism, which gives the Holy Spirit. A special case. A special case. And uh, baptism and confirmation, because the idea of uh, confirmation in the Catholic theology is that when one becomes, let's say, a young man, he will uh, again confirm his faith by uh, proclaiming this faith again in front of his church. So the idea of confirmation is different from the idea of sealing with Miron in our church. So if we go deeper in that rosa, what Miron means, why was it given, when was it given to the baptized, we will see that we have the idea, I will say it in one sentence, and then it needs maybe later explanation. But uh, when Miron was introduced to be given after the baptism in our church, not earlier than the fourth century, and it was for the heretics. Because when the heretics were coming to the church, they, want, they didn't want to repeat the baptism again. It will case scandals in the church to baptize thousands and thousands of people coming. So they decided to give them the anointing, the sealing with the miron to confirm the faith. The idea of confirmation is there. And to give them the Holy Spirit, which they probably didn't receive it through their baptism in the heretical uh, sections or groups. So it was a different idea why we anoint with the oil after the baptism. The oil was used inside the baptism before putting the person inside the water. We had the oil, then we put it in the water. But when the heretics were accepted again in the church, we added another anointing with the oil after the water, which became the holy mirror for not repeating, to avoid repeating the baptism. Thank you so much, Abuna. I, I, I guess you have a lot of questions. You can ask Abuna always and after the, uh, the session. We have to end here. Uh, uh, but before ending, uh, let me uh, welcome uh, the two representatives, the representative of uh, Belda, 
uh, Belda, who are uh, always helping uh, our uh, uh, youth organization here in Sweden, uh, SUF and SUKU. Thank you so much for coming here. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, we are only starting today. Yesterday, actually, uh, we started, and we have uh, until uh, August 5th. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being with us. God bless you. Uh, now we'll have um, a coffee break, and then, um, and then we go for a, a group discussion. Yesterday, I, I saw on your hand a color, or a colored, uh, yes. Please divide yourself upon those colors. Yeah,